normally the more tired people are and the more hours that they're having to work, the more likely they are to make a mistake. So I have drawn some correlation between that as far as productivity, total hours worked in their quality, which is interesting. And then that also to senior leadership, if I'm, especially if I'm asking for more help or more travelers or something, I can say, you know, yeah, we're getting the work done, but you know, we're really wearing people out and this is what my percent of turnover is. I've got, you know, X number of percent turnover. So those are all metrics, you know, that we track also. Rising above the ultrasonic cleaners and the clanking of stainless steel are the ideas and voices that are changing an industry. You're listening to the Beyond Clean podcast, the central nexus for people, processes and products that are improving our sterile processing world. Each week we speak with frontline technicians, CEOs, engineers and entrepreneurs with a common goal to help you fight dirty every instrument, every time. Whether you're tuning in for education or inspiration, we're glad Glad you did. Now turn on those washers and turn up the volume. It's time to go Beyond Clean. On this episode of Beyond Clean, we are going to be talking with Sarah Vinson, Director of Sterile Processing at UF Health. And Hank, we are talking all about tracking systems and data this season. But in this episode, we're going to be focused on ooh, surveys, Mufasa. accreditation, <laughs> scary, scary topics. So... But Sarah's going to guide you through it, and she's going to help you kind of come up with some ways to utilize this data and this organized fashion to help you get through these surveys and hopefully with flying colors. Yeah, confidence is the key word here, Justin. You want to go into these surveys completely confident, knowing that you've got the data to show that your department is doing what it should be doing. So the big takeaway from this interview should be, hey, we've got the documents. Let me just put this right in front of you, surveyor. You read it. You walk away thinking this department has got it all together. That's the takeaway. And I'm very confident that Sarah is going to lay out the arguments for us today. All right. We're going to be right back after a short break. Joining us, Sarah Vincent, Director of Sterile Processing at UF Health. I'm Justin Poulin. And I'm Hank Walsh. From 17 Studios, you're listening to Beyond Clean, the global voice of sterile processing. Joining us now is Sarah Vinson, Director of Sterile Processing at UF Health. And we just talked to you not too long ago, Sarah. And I also want to give a shout out because you're a member of the advisory group. And this season is not only about tracking, tracking systems and getting data out of those systems, but apparently it's also highlighting a number of advisory group members because we've had so many of you as guests this season. And so it's been a nice opportunity to raise awareness for that and the good work that you've been doing. I know that if anybody is a regular listener, they heard you talk a little bit about your background not too long ago on an episode, but if you wouldn't mind telling everybody about yourself and maybe even your early experience with the advisory group, because we haven't asked anybody that yet this season. Yeah, I think it's been a really unique opportunity it's always awesome when someone asks for your input and advice for an industry that you're really passionate about. And I think everyone I've met so far are all like-minded people who are super passionate about sterile processing and are excited to take us to the next level and make us more widely known to the world. So, And as we start this conversation around tracking systems, maybe tell us about your experience with tracking systems in general? Is this something that you're incredibly passionate about and you utilize in, in a day-to-day? Yes, I am a data analytics nerd. So I take my tracking systems, or at least I try to, to the next level, even probably beyond what most people even realize they're capable of doing. But, you know, I think I shared last time I've been doing sterile processing for 20 years now. And so I, I come from the generation where we had the note cards or one piece of paper in a drawer. And you better hope that when you go to the drawer, the person didn't take the last paper. So, you know, we've come a long way and tracking systems, I think, are an amazing tool that 
we can utilize. So we're going to tie all of this tracking system conversation to really the focus of this interview, which will nuance it from so many others this season, which has everything to do with accreditation and those surveys. And so maybe as we start to narrow our focus in this conversation and differentiate from a lot of the other ones that we've had this season, can you talk about some trending that is going on related to sterile processing around the expectations and maybe newer focuses during these surveys that are happening? So we actually had our survey two months ago. So this is kind of fresh in my mind of what they recently asked us. So we had our triannual survey and a big one that I hadn't been asked previously were records for preventative maintenance and access and knowing when a machine is safe for use. You know, I think most of us are tracking our daily quality checks and biologicals and, you know, whatever the requirements are. But as far as maintenance go, that was kind of a curveball for me, this recent survey. So you got Justin all excited talking about preventative maintenance. I love preventative (laughs) maintenance. And, And Joint Commission looks at that stuff. I mean, they've got a big focus on that. I think in the past, it had been a little bit more squarely placed on biomed and clinical engineering than it had sterile processing, but they've obviously broadened that. And you're right. I just stole Hank's thunder immediately <laughs> when he brought he it up. He couldn't stay quiet. Yeah, but here <laughs> he comes. Uh, we all knew Justin was coming with the PM conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but in your description, Sarah, like you were kind of alluding to equipment. And I'm curious, like I'm always curious, right? You know, but... That's probably the number one question besides like, what instrument is this on Facebook? <laughs> but the number two question maybe is, hey, what is Joint Commission? What is DNV asking for or looking for this year? Because our survey window is coming up, you know. So you're saying here recently it was the PM documentation. Is there anything else that kind of stood out? Because I know folks are going to be curious about that. So not to get off track too far from tracking systems, but the one thing I was surprised, and this had never happened before either, was we were touring with a surveyor to the different areas, like mostly clinics that we provide instrumentation to. And she was opening the trays in front of the unit staff and asking them, how do you know this tray is safe and let's go through it together? You know, so normally they look at the exterior package. This is the first time I've actually seen a surveyor take the time to open it up, check for indicators, make sure there's no staining that the frontline staff Ah. using it. So, you know, the ER nurses knew that it was a good product. So that was interesting as well. That is unique and new. So that's an important trend because they've been looking at pill packs very closely for the last couple of years because they can see through them without opening them. But to open trays, and especially this goes back to Justin's kind of sweet spot, the instrument taping, because you see a lot of taping on the containerized to the wrap trays. And oftentimes that can be missed because Joint Commission is looking at all the pill packs, right? But yeah, that's a very important point there. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Back to the data point, though. So you mentioned PMs. Were there any other data-related questions that came up on your recent survey that you'd want to highlight? I always get asked to show the, you know, normally the same day's testing of equipment. So like a sterilizer record, that's pretty standard. And that's been the way for several years or a washer test documentation. You know, and I think having that electronic in a single source makes it easier to recall and pull up, you know, because depending on if you're still on paper, tracking it down and then they follow you around your department and walk past other things you might not want them to walk past. It's easier (laughs) to just keep them put at the computer. And it's like, well, this is on the computer. Oh, this is on the computer. But um, yeah, right. right. So that's a good kind of setup here, right? Because I had a question about, are they looking at enough data. And I know like, (laughs) I want to be careful here because there may be some joint commission surveyors listening. Hopefully they are getting educated and I feel bad for all the other departments out there, but we're going to really drill down. Like what should they be looking at data wise that they're not looking at today, or at least in your experience, right? I think they gloss over your key performance metrics normally. I think they get excited if you have them, but they don't necessarily expect everyone to track it 
in the SPD department specifically. You know, I think the clinical areas have always done a good job historically of having good metrics for what they're tracking for patient outcomes. But, you know, SPD related, you know, you got to think our, our metrics are really related to quality and we don't want to air our dirty laundry about, you know, how many mistakes we make or different <laughs> right. things we're doing, but it's important to track so you know if you're getting better. So that one, I think I don't hear often enough. Mm. Yeah, one of the crazy stats from the Joint Commission, at least, and this is probably a couple of years old now, but like crazy number, like 70 to 80 percent of the Joint Commission findings of immediate threat to life are coming from sterilization and reprocessing, like just crazy high number. And the fact that we're still just scratching the surface of what they're looking at, that's kind of why I, I said, you know, tongue in cheek, but I really feel like the Joint Commission DNV are still learning along with the industry on like, what are those KPIs, as you mentioned, like, what are the things they should be looking at that they should be digging into? Can you talk through some of the other categories that a sterile processing department should be preparing for and considering as they get ready for these visits, both to pass the survey, but also to help educate these surveyors on, hey, this is what you should be looking for that really signifies a high performing department. I think having metrics, period, will set you apart because I think... Um, <laughs> okay, step one. Good, okay. <laughs> have something that you track uh, more than just, you know, productivity or quality. I think if you can be creative about different things, you know, we had a great catch award, for example, and we used, you know, within our tracking system, a quality module where staff who caught things in assembly, like, you know, I caught something that was broken, so I replaced it or my trays were mixed up, so I corrected it. And we documented how many times we successfully caught it before it went to the mm. or to kind of highlight. I love that. The yeah, high proactive. Level, yeah, the high level of detail that it takes just to put, you know, one tray together. You know, someone could have corrected four or five things in one tray and all the effort that that takes. Mm. That point is massive. So I just want to reiterate, we put a lot of emphasis in sterile processing historically on like a reactive quality assurance program that if the OR complains about it, then we fix it. And we kind of act like, hey, we're doing a good job. <laughs> but really, the target should be the OR doesn't have to catch it or complain about it, that it's fixed prior to it getting to the OR. So that good catch program that you're talking about, like that is so key. And to document to your point, how many individual catches in each unique tray. I mean, that's a, that's a huge data point. So you're actually tracking that. And then you could show that to a joint commission surveyor is what you're saying. Is it the quality assurance tech who's capturing that? Or like, what's that process just for folks who are kind of curious? So you could do it a couple different ways. I've seen it where it's a dedicated quality assurance coordinator doing audits, but I've actually trained my staff in the past to every every technician has the ability to document what they're doing. And we try to make it an incentive. So the top three great catchers got put on our communication board and we did raffles for gift cards and things like that to motivate them to want to take the time because, you know, obviously... We know they work hard and they're very busy. So if I'm asking them to do just one more thing, you know, we wanted to, to recognize that. But to your point, I think I like to highlight, you know, even though we might make mistakes because we're human, I could show with metrics that, you know, I might have let three slip by, but look at how many we caught, you know, and that tells a huge story, too. We just had a conversation about putting quality into more of a percentage versus a total count. And I love how you just position that. If I can show out of the total number of opportunities, how many actually got through, it creates a percentage, which creates a different perspective on it. What about infection control? I mean, when you're talking about these audits, I did an interview on another podcast 
talking about audits. And ironically, it was for transmission control, which is an infection control podcast. But the person who we interviewed, Misty, had just moved from an infection control position to leading SPD and was talking about the importance of audits, but in the sense of her role in infection control. Do they get involved in any of these audits and the structure that you're putting together to get the data or are they kind of removed from that and it's more of just a an internal department process that you have set up? Not for tray accuracy auditing. I'm I'm used to infection control doing rounding, which is more environment of care type checks, which even that you can make trackable in your tracking system if you create it as a task and you know you can run reports for that. But you know, they're more so looking at EVS, like housekeeping type things, is it is it clean or staff wearing, you know, the correct surgical attire? You know, if you have a, a program where you're using ATP or some other, you know, testing swabs on your instruments, you could document that. And that I have done in the past with some infection control partners, but not necessarily for, for tray audits. So going back to that preemptive or proactive quality assurance program that we were talking about it. I know we kind of uh, approached this question already, but the question on whose responsibility is it ultimately to gather, number one, but then to verify the data, number two, is it a technician's responsibility? Is it supervisors? Is it the educators, ultimately the department leader? What roles do they play along that continuum of building the total data package that would be presented to that surveyor who comes in? I've always done that myself as, you know, either the manager or director, honestly, just because, again, I love data and get really excited about sharing it. I think, you know, the input comes from staff, like the data entry, you know, what they catch goes in there. Or, you know, obviously, if you're tracking from the OR standpoint, what we miss, you know, that gets documented by the OR. The verification, you know, confirming is it accurate can be done typically by a supervisor or coordinator if you're fortunate enough to have those resources. But, you know, I think that's probably why Joint Commission doesn't ask often about metrics because we don't have a standard, you know. (laughs) We don't all do the same thing and we don't all have the same types of technicians. We're all different, but we all are striving for the same goal. So that kind of is challenging. You know, what should be an acceptable percentage and what do you use to track it? Is it instruments? Is it sets? Is it cases? Is it, you know? Yeah, that just came up on the last episode that we had with Cody Trout on trying to set some of these industry standards. And it's an interesting conversation because we've got a group out there, you know, Amy, who sets a lot of the industry guidelines, you know, best practices around that. But a lot of these data type standards or expectations they're kind of still out there in like a i don't no man's land right you know no one has really come out and said this is what we should be measuring to and comparing against so yeah you're right it's a lot of opportunity and i think to go back to the advisory group that justin mentioned at the beginning like there's a lot of opportunity for groups like that group to get together a hundred clinical leaders from across the country and say, hey, we're going to really dive into the data and say, hey, let's set a standard and start measuring against it and just see what happens. You know, let's see what the data tells us and then learn over time. I'm not saying that is the golden ticket or the silver bullet, you know, but at least we can get somewhere as opposed to everyone out there doing their own thing, which is kind of what's going on right now. And it causes that you know, question for the surveyors, right? Because they're going into different departments every single day and every single week with different standards and different measurements and trying to untangle this to say, what am I actually looking at? And is this working or is it not working? So I think that's a terrific point. Let's talk concrete examples. We love to give like real, tangible, actionable takeaways for folks who listen to the podcast. What are some ways that folks can take these data-driven conversations, bring it to a surveyor and have it ready and say, hey, we're doing a good job or we're at least, you know, trying to get there, even if we're struggling along? Like, what are some of those things that you've had good success with or maybe that you'd like to see in the industry 
use more data around to speak to these surveyors. That's kind of a hard one because not everything is necessarily data specific as far as a metric. You know, again, quality, I could talk about quality over and over, but you know, one thing that surveyors have, have liked in the past is just a quick, easy access of anything that you're tracking. So, you know, this is an example of something that I got recognized by a surveyor where, you know, how, how often do you clean your sterilizer drain? And we're like, well, we do it every day because that's what the manufacturer says. And like, well, how do it's you... It's documented. Yeah. And they're like, well, how do you know? I'm like, well, let me show you. I have, we scan it in and here's a barcode and I can run a report and here's the report. And so having that quick, easy, accessible information, I think they're always amazed by that versus, you know, again, like, let me shuffle through this binder. And they're like, well, what was that paper? I saw a blank there. <laughs> you know, oh, let's, yeah, let's right. pull that out and take a look at that. And it's, you know, I think the more organized and clean, you know, you can have just all information, the the better. I love that. You literally want to process the surveyor through your department, right? Like the quicker and the more efficient you can give them what they need and have them walk out feeling, feeling like everything was in order usually winds up with some pretty good survey results, right? And the more they got to dig around and find the more they will find those gaps and it, you're building confidence in them when you're utilizing a tracking system to give them the reporting they're looking for too. Don't you think? Yeah. And I think, you know, some tracking systems, I haven't obviously used every single one on the market, but you know, most of them you can set up to have alerts. So, you know, Hey, send me an email or a message if this, doesn't occur, you know, so I can follow up with it. When everything's on paper, you're relying on, you know, someone to manually go around and check all these things where you can actually have a lot of that automated and it makes it a lot easier to do, you know, spot checks and audits as a manager. Like, let me go and check and make sure my staff have all done the documentation they need today. I can pull up one screen, you know, nowadays with, with us all doing Zoom, you know, I hate to admit it, but I can multitask and kind of do some audits over here while I'm having a conversation. You and over Justin here. both on the multitasking. <laughs> oh, the cat's out of the bag. This was my dirty secret. No, it's the not beyond, secret. <laughs> well, a secret outside of the Beyond Clean team. Hey, it works. Smarter, not harder. That's what I say. That's awesome. <laughs> well, to also know, I just want to. Say, you <laughs> have ADHD too. Is really <laughs> is what we're talking about here. <laughs> I also want to give a shout out or a call out to all these tracking systems out there because there's a huge opportunity to integrate these PM schedules and the PM expectations in the tracking system itself. Because right now, to my understanding. A majority of those kind of reminders that you mentioned have to be manually inputted by the user, right? So, like, we got to say, hey, our Steris autoclave requires all these PMs, so let's put some reminders in there. Our ultrasonic requires all this, let's put all these reminders in there. It'd be great because all these models are shared around the industry. If there was a standard PM kind of package that you upload your model of equipment, and then it automatically sets up all these things need to be done. The filter, the drain, the cleaning of the chamber, all that stuff. Man, that would just be a great step forward in hardwiring all that compliance conversation that we're talking about so that if a leader doesn't know these things need to happen, it's kind of built in for them because there's a lot, like everything that's plugged into a wall <laughs> has some kind of PM, you know, from the heat sealer to the ultrasonic to the autoclave, as we've been talking about. So yeah, those are critical opportunities for our partners out there to kind of help us go forward as an industry and be Honestly, Hank, you could actually use the PM tool in a lot of these because they'll let you set it up on a time related. Yeah. Well, that's you what could I'm just create it as a set and give it a barcode and well, put it right, on a PM schedule. And then, yeah. Yeah. But put the, the impetus on the vendors, I guess, is what I'm saying, Justin. Mm. Like, if you leave it up to users, like guys like me will forget things. <laughs> like, I'm horrible about that. I'll just leave it out or I'll forget to check this one thing. But if I can put the model number in, and it populates like that would just be a dream come true. Well, it's kind of like a hard stop with some of your other daily tests. It'll alert if you go to start a load to say, hey, you haven't done your daily Bowie Dick test for the day. Or, hey, you need a biological. I would think you could pop up and say, hey, this is your one month. Let's do whatever our, our check is. So, Right, right. 
So question about productivity. We spend a lot of time and a lot of data around productivity in sterile processing. Have you ever had an accreditation surveyor ask you how productive is your staff? Never. I never have. Um, you so know. what do you think about that? Like, why is that a disconnect? <laughs> is it productivity important for a clinician? You know, I think if you walk into the room and there's an excessive amount of backlog, that might bring up some questions related to productivity or staffing, you know, if, if they see a bunch of stuff down. But just generally, and in my most recent survey, pro- productivity doesn't normally come up. And I think I would assume because the focus is on quality, you know, so right. what what's your output? Is, is your quality good? And Yeah, see, that's my... That's my soapbox, I guess, but I see the two connected, and I'll tell you why. We've got 20 surgeries on the schedule tomorrow, right? All 20 of those folks matter. It's like not just the first cases. All 20 of those folks need their surgeries tomorrow because that's why they're on the schedule. And getting to that, like there's a quality piece that they all need quality surgeries, but there's a quantity piece or a productivity piece that all their trays need to be done. So somehow we've got to get to that that number or that target as an industry to say we can provide for all the surgeries that are being scheduled. And I totally agree. Like Joint Commission, like their expectation is quality, regardless of how many surgeries are scheduled, you cannot compromise quality. But then the challenge for us internally for the department is how do we keep up that level of quality up to the quantity of that surgical volume? Have you seen through the COVID ups and downs and the spikes and what's the opposite of a spike? Valley. Peak and valley is the way to go. <laughs> spikes with that. and val- mountains and val- peaks and valleys. There you go. How have you navigated data wise that, that challenge of quantity versus quality in the last two and a half years of the pandemic? So I typically look at just a steady flow of scanning or productivity in general. You know, so if I know a technician clocks in at 7 a.m., you know, I should see their first scan, you know, 10 minutes after, you know, because we give them time to dress. And as long as I can show that they were productive doing something throughout their shift, you know, it's hard to say you must do X number of any type of task, depending on how you have them assigned. But as long as I can prove that they were consistently doing something throughout their day, that helps. And I think, you know, that's another part of tracking systems. I don't think everyone utilizes is creating tasks for all the different things you do. Cause staff want to get credit for the work that they do. Answer you the know, phone. Unloading, yep. yeah, answer the phone, right. unload the cart washer, you know, organize the pans from the pan racks. Like that all takes time. You know, and, and as a leader, yeah, right. you know, we can set what seems reasonable. You know, if it takes me 25 minutes and I'm, you know, the one slow, then everybody else should be able to do it at 25 minutes or, or less. You know, I think that's where the leadership decision comes in as far as what's acceptable productivity. You know, we have such high turnover, unfortunately, and I don't think we're unique in that, that it's really hard to set a productivity metric either because all my staff are learning, you know, most of them are learning and new or my staff with experience are helping train, you know, so where they probably could have been more productive, they're helping, you know, they have to slow down and help other people. So it's, it's really a hard, that's, I mean, that's really a hard one to be consistent unless you just have a a stellar team that never turns over. (laughs) Right. Which is (laughs) not common in the industry. Yeah. Yeah. That point again is huge because Whatever model or metric you're using, it has to account for growth. A one-year technician should not be producing at the same level as a five-year, 10-year technician. And especially going back to the data piece, like how clean is your data? Like We haven't talked about that in this episode, you know, but are your count sheets complete? Do you have photos of your instruments? Are the product numbers there? Is your backup inventory organized so that it's easy to find a replacement? All those things can slow down that productivity number. And I completely agree, like setting some generic standard outside of reality really does a disservice, I think, to our technicians. So I totally agree with that. 
Yeah, I thought of one metric that I use on my current dashboard to kind of show a correlation if quality is, you know, potentially slipping is looking at overtime, you know, what percent of worked hours is overtime? Because normally the more tired people are and the more hours that they're having to work, the more likely they are to make mistakes. So I have drawn some correlation between that as far as productivity, total hours worked in their quality which is interesting. And then that also to senior leadership, if I'm, especially if I'm asking for more help or more travelers or something, I can say, you know, yeah, we're getting the work done, but you know, we're really wearing people out and this is what my percent of turnover is. I've got, you know, X number of percent turnover. So those are all metrics, you know, that we track also. You brought up a really good point too, with leadership. If you do wind up having, you know, some things show up on your, your survey, You've got to explain that and having the data to show leadership because you've got a small amount of time to educate them. They're going to be a little disgruntled about the performance of the department based on how the survey is representing that. And they're not even going to understand necessarily the context of, is this a simple fix or is this a huge fix? And was this a huge fix that you kind of been warning me about all along by saying, I had the data, I had the data, you just weren't approving what I needed in the budget. <laughs> That's a difficult conversation that requires an enormous amount of tact. And I can see where data could be hugely helpful in those conversations when the spotlight is shining bright. As we kind of wrap up, I guess that's really the last question that we have for you is other leaders that find themselves in you know these positions with maybe a limited amount of reporting, a limited amount of implemented data functions in their tracking systems. What would you do to encourage them to say it's worth putting in a few extra hours a week? It's worth doing whatever you can to build these functions. How would you encourage them to to get to that next level? Because obviously everything we talked about is sort of like, oh, yeah, if I had that, boy, would it save me in a pinch. But we talked about this on the last podcast, which was in a lot of ways, we feel like the data is just a a CYA mechanism. And I have a feeling that if we're going to really encourage other leaders to put in a little extra effort and get where you've gone with this and maybe where you even want to still go with this, that they're going to need more than CYA to motivate them. I think if you don't know how to, because not everyone's super tech savvy. I mean, it took me a while to learn. I mean, even logging into this podcast, (laughs) you know, I struggle (laughs) sometimes. But, um, you know, reach out to your vendor, like reach out to whoever your local person is, because I bet they have some sort of class that they could do for you in person or online or cheat sheets. Because really, the hardest part is going to be setting it up. So to your point, if you can set aside two, three days to just dedicate to building it, once it's built, you know, what your data points are. The nice thing about the tracking system is it does a lot of the work for you after you've taken the time to set it up. And maybe, you know, and maybe your vendor will will help you with that. So don't be afraid to ask because they're going to assume, you know, no news is good news. So if you're not calling them, they're going to think you've you've figured it all out. So definitely reach out. Yeah, it's set it and don't forget it, I think, in this case, for sure. Sarah, awesome interview, as always. You did a great job. Just a was it only one season ago? Might have been (laughs) two, but I think it might have only been one season ago. It might have been the first time we had somebody on in back-to-back seasons. So not only are you've got that beyond clean advisory group designation, but I think you you've got a a special place in beyond clean history with back-to-back season appearances. So thanks so much for coming on again. No, thank you guys. That was Sarah Vinson, Director of Sterile Processing at UF Health. And we're talking about, oh, yes, surveys, Hank. Uh, That's kind of the taboo word. Everybody gets a little freaked out about that. But how can data support you? How can it defend your position? How can it show quality and consistency within the department? And as we talked about How quickly can you move the surveyors through the department with a sense of confidence that everything is in order, that it's organized, and that there's checks and balances? A lot of key takeaways here from Sarah today. And again, no surprise from a Beyond Clean advisory group member. Yeah, Justin, one of the biggest takeaways for me was that PM data. Like, If Joint Commission is asking for it today, you're going to want to get that prepared. 
And so if you don't already have that built into your current tracking system or your manual process, look at every piece of equipment that plugs in, that's got power to it, that has PM requirements and start outlining those PMs and start documenting that today and offer that preemptively to the surveyor to say, hey, we've got this covered and I've got all the data points to prove it, that will go a long way in expediting that survey process and making sure that you're passing with flying colors. All right, that's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can support Beyond Clean by subscribing to our podcast on Apple, Amazon, or Google Podcasts. We're also on apps like Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or if you've got your favorite podcast application, you can just search for the Beyond Clean podcast right on there and subscribe. We've also got bonus content. If you download our smartphone app for iPhone and Android, which is absolutely the best way to subscribe to Beyond Clean episodes, and we've also got that bonus content if you click on the gift box there on the app. While you're there downloading the app, we'd love it if you just gave us a rating and a review Five because stars. your feedback is important to the show. And if you have any topics that you'd like us to cover on a future episode, just send an email to info at beyondclean.net. And on behalf of Hank and myself. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Beyond Clean. <laughs>